Ferrari, the most well-known automaker in the world, builder of some of the finest cars in history, and also huge sticklers. Why is Ferrari sending cease and desist letters to celebs doing things with their cars? I think Ferrari is going about it all wrong. First, a little disclosure. I'm a big Ferrari fan. I have been ever since I was a kid, so all this is gonna come from a place of love. Second, a few months ago, we built the most American Ferrari ever. And the whole time, I was secretly hoping that we would get a cease and desist from Ferrari. I think Ferrari's gonna send us a cease and desist. Kinda hope they do. It's like a little badge of honor. That seemed like it'd be pretty cool, like a rite of passage. We didn't, but the experience had me wondering. Why did I think we were gonna hear from Ferrari's legal department in the first place? I'm gonna tell you about two cases. One where Ferrari was in the right, and one where I'm not so sure. I first learned what a cease and desist was back in 2014, when I read that Ferrari insisted electronic music god Deadmau5 fix his custom Ferrari 458. Deadmau's prancing horse had been giving a bright blue rap featuring Nyan Cat, a cute little putty tat whose body was a Pop-Tart. Adorable. <laughs> to complete the build, the Ferrari was also given custom badges, floor mats, and a license plate proclaiming Ferrari. Nice. A cease and desist is a document sent by a business or individual, in this case Ferrari, to another business or individual, in this case Deadmau5, warning them that if they don't quit partaking in a perceived illegal action, more legal action will be taken. The illegal actions in Ferrari's eyes were the custom Ferrari badges and floor mat. If Deadmau5 didn't remove these offending items from the 458, Ferrari would sue his ass into oblivion. His career would be turned into ghosts and stuff. Am I right, Burbank? <laughs> Tough crowd. <coughs> you want know f you. This was kind of a big deal at the time. Dead Mouse had a reputation of being a troll, and a company as big as Ferrari had taken notice. I'm guessing it must have been pretty validating for him, even if it meant he had to remove the wrap and the custom badges. It was a legal win for Ferrari, but as we'll see later. I don't think it was worth it. Just this year, Ferrari sent out another high-profile cease and desist, and this one was a doozy. German designer Philip Plein received an order from Ferrari to take down an Instagram post, which featured his shoes on the hood of his Ferrari 812 Superfast. In their cease and desist, Ferrari's lawyers argue that Plein's posts tarnish the reputation of the Ferrari brand perception and causes further material damage. That clause is extremely subjective in my completely ignorant opinion. But later on in the letter, they make a better case. The undesirable connection between Ferrari's trademarks on the one hand and Philip Pline's line of shoes on the other, quote, interferes with Ferrari to sell their own line of shoes, apparently. Okay, so that makes a little bit of sense, I guess. Ferrari says that placing the shoes next to the Ferrari logo, along with the color coordination, might mislead some customers into thinking that this is some sort of collab. So they wanna nip that right in the bud, understandable. But when they say that Ferrari's trademark and model cars are associated in your pictures with a lifestyle totally inconsistent with Ferrari's brand perception, that's where they lose me. He's got babes and cars and the mansion and the Ferrari. Isn't that exactly how everyone perceives Ferrari? I think that's what bugs me about Ferrari so much. They act like they don't know who buys their cars. No other company acts this way. What if Nike sued people for reselling their shoes? What if Dodge sent cease and desists to people who kept the bumper guards on? Actually, if you do that, you should be sued. That's just my opinion. But I digress. Maybe Ferrari is right. If that's not the lifestyle and perception that Ferrari wants, then what is? We need to look closer at their history to find out, but not too into it because this isn't up to speed. Ferrari started building road cars back in the late 40s. The Ferrari 125S was a sports car, of course, that could pull double duty as a cruiser and full-time race car. Racing back then was different. They basically raced on closed off public roads. Enzo Ferrari, the guy who started Ferrari, had no other choice but to build road cars if he wanted to build race cars. Since the company had so much experience winning races, the road cars were really, really good. Regardless, Ferrari's reputation was built upon two pillars, race cars and road cars inspired by those race cars. 
The name Ferrari became synonymous with performance, especially if you ignore their 2019 F1 season. Am I right, Burbank? Come on, come on, Chuckle Hut. I'm on fire. That legacy of victory, which celebrated its 90th anniversary this year, mind you, is what Ferrari is talking about when they say lifestyle and perception in their cease and desist letters. In Ferrari's own words, the Ferrari logo with its iconic prancing horse symbolizes Italian luxury, exclusivity, performance, blah, 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 we get it. But in the case of Philip Klein's shoes and babes, I don't think Ferrari is in the right because I don't think the perception Ferrari has of themselves is how everyone else in the world sees Ferrari. Now, what I'm about to say is uh, completely anecdotal and thus inadmissible in court. But have you ever seen someone ask if any random sports car is a Ferrari? I have. According to my mom, every red sports car is a Ferrari. The prancing horse has almost become like Kleenex, right? Kleenex is a brand name of facial tissue, but everyone just calls facial tissues Kleenex. I think Ferrari's public perception has moved far beyond victory and performance to just nice sports car in general, which is why I have such a hard time with them going after Philip Klein. To non-car people, Ferrari doesn't symbolize Italian luxury, exclusivity, performance, design, and the quality the world over. The prancing horse symbolizes success because they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Nobody who saw Philip Klein's post would think, huh, this post definitely makes me think less of Ferrari. They're thinking, huh, that guy probably fucks. Again, I have literally zero legal experience besides Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney. But I think this whole cease and desist thing goes beyond the courtroom and into the court of public opinion. My question is, would seeing Ferrari tell owners what they can and cannot do with their cars dissuade someone from buying one? Would they look somewhere else? Lamborghini looks like Ferrari on the surface. They're Italian, they make fast cars, and they've got a farm animal as their mascot. But Lamborghini differs in one major area. They know who the frick is buying their car. Since the beginning, Lambo's whole plan has been to build the most ridiculous and flashy cars for ridiculous and flashy people. James went to the Lamborghini factory last year and he said it was basically like an old school speed shop. Their cars might cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but Lamborghini is all about building the craziest shit possible. And their clientele knows this. You don't buy a Lamborghini because you want people to know you enjoy Italian luxury, exclusivity, performance, design, and quality. You buy it because you're insane. Why do you think Alex Troy chose the Huracan to build his unicorn on? In Dead Mouse's case, Ferrari didn't really have a choice when it came to sending that cease and desist. Remember those floor mats and badges? Cute, right? Well, Ferrari argued that the logos infringed on their copyright, which they had the right to protect. If Ferrari didn't go after Deadmau, it could have come back to bite them in the butt. If another, more serious infringement happened in the future and Ferrari didn't go after those floor mats, the prospective defendant could point at that and say, hey, you guys didn't do anything about that. Why should we listen to you? And that could hold up in court because of precedent. Large companies like Ferrari have to go after every case of copyright infringement, no matter how small, to keep something like that from happening. What about our friend Philip Plan? I think that's too far. He's a rich fashionista whose whole brand revolves around decadent opulence. As we discussed, he's pretty much the perfect client and no one thinks those shoes are gonna be a collab. Come on, Ferrari, what are we doing? In the end, I think Ferrari is just a weird company in general. They make incredible machines and you can't argue with their heritage, but I think their quest to protect that heritage at all costs makes them seem a bit stuck up and that might alienate future buyers. I think it would behoove them to rethink their brand perception a little bit and have more fun. I mean, you guys make supercars for crying out loud. Hey guys, we made a show called Car Wars. The donut gang going against some of your favorite YouTubers like uh, Linus Tech know, Tips. My favorite challenge team. was the cruise control Whoa. race with Gus Johnson. I surprisingly was not what? very good at it, but Gus killed it. So check it out. That's, That's Car Wars, wherever you get your videos. Love you guys. Like I said at the top, you can't see me. I said I like you. Remember? 
I said that. Be nice. I'll see you next time. I need time. protection. Don't send the Tafosi after me. Bye.